Good morning. Thanks for attending our Encore Group webinar. This is Dan Johnson. I'm the Business Development Manager here, and John Jackson, our principal, will be speaking on successfully managing project risks in just a moment. Just wanted to welcome you. Uh, because of the number of attendees this morning, if you do have a question, we'd like to encourage you to use the tool uh, on the side of your screen there. There's a box for questions. You can type those in to me, and I'll respond to you as, as is possible. Um, there's also a chat feature there if you're having any, any problems. And we would like to encourage you to take our survey at the end. There's some new products that were coming out due to uh, demand from our customers we think you'll be interested in. And if for some reason you don't see that survey, I can send that back out in a follow-up follow -up email along with uh, the handout notes and uh, respond to your questions at that time. So thank you again for joining us. And John, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dan. Good morning, um, and welcome to this webinar. Um, just want to give you uh, a quick overview. This is part two of a uh, webinar that we uh, conducted uh, regarding just successfully managing uh, projects and having successful projects. So uh, if those of you that may have attended our webinar, uh, our previous webinar, we will be uh, going a little more in depth into some of those items that we discussed in our last one regarding risk. Uh, when it comes to risk management, um, there are so many different things to uh, address. Um, and before we get started, I wanted to just find a little bit about our audience, just to get an idea of uh, where, where we are with our audience. So I'm going to ask a couple of questions. You'll see a poll um, show up on your screen. If you wouldn't mind giving it just, I'm going to give just a few seconds for you to answer. And if you are attending, if you wouldn't mind responding to those polls, we want to find out just how, how many of you are attending webinars to start with. And it, it appears, I'm going to go ahead and close that one, it appears that um, about 75 percent of you are um, doing less than one a month. I would, um, let's see here, I, I'd like to know a little bit about some of your experience bases. Some of you are in a group. Uh, if you're in a group, just kind of give me an average of uh, the group that's there. If, if not, just let me uh, kind of know what your experience level is. We'll go through these pretty quick, so if you'll... We've got a, a pretty good experience base. I'm going to go ahead and close that one. And uh, about 45% of you have been in the uh, construction industry for uh, 45 uh, for over 20 years. That's a good experience base. I'm sorry if you're in the wrong <laughs> webinar. Um, let's uh, let's do another one. Let me just find out uh, your role in construction. If you're an owner, consultant, uh, subcontractor, developer, contractor, just to give you an idea of our audience base. We have a pretty good um, pretty good uh, group of owners. About 45 percent of you are owners, 46 percent. We have several consultants in the uh, group today and a few contractors. Let's do one more and um, let's talk about some project management software. Uh, just kind of give me an overview of how many of you are using some of the uh, newer technology that's out there and uh, just just a general idea. Okay, I'll close that one. We've got uh, some users out there. All right. Well, let's talk about let's talk about risk in construction project. You know, the ISO thirty one thousand risk management standard defines risk as the effective 
uh, of uncertainty on objects, the effect of uncertainty on objects. That's the definition of risk. In fact, Daniel uh, Kahneman says in his latest book, Thinking Fast and Slow, there's uh, two risk management decision-making processes. One is with the part of our brain that's largely unconscious. It makes rapid decisions uh, based on memory and emotions. It's kind of like the, the fight or flight response. That's one way to manage risk, and that's uh, one method of managing risk. There's the other part of our brain in the neocortex, which is the more logic side of our brain, that has the capacity for detailed analysis, uh, abstract thought, logical in inquiry. But uh, unfortunately, our logical brain is easily distracted, painfully slow. In fact, it's hard to engage sometimes, particularly if we, when as situations are, are uh, coming in front of us all the time. The way to manage this plays into risk management. It's a question of how you'll manage issues on your construction projects as they come up. Um, the only reason we have risk management is because risks, whether worst case scenarios, often occur. How do you plan for it, manage and resolve them? That will have an, a significant difference in how, your, uh, how successful your projects are. So some of the success axioms for managing risk come down to leading and managing, uh, defining a vision and strategy for your project, articulating goals and objectives for your project, and then putting the right team together, right? Know who the stakeholders are. Uh, put good processes in place. Plan your work. Coordinate. Communicate. Execute. You know, manage changes. This is just a list of things. You know, um, be focused and, and tenacious. And then question and test often. Be, be looking back over how things are going and doing a, a quick test to see how well you're managing your risk. And then being flexible and agile. And then, you know, for putting these types of practices in place is what we're going to talk about in our webinar today. These are so important in managing risk because there are so many risks out there. The types of risk that you typically run into, there's many different ways to classify risk. Uh, I've seen several different formats. Uh, but one, risk of, one form of risk classification is uh, breaking your risk into socioeconomic factors. That's like environmental issues, uh, public safety, public utilization, uh, e the economy is a big socioeconomic factor. Uh, exchange rates and uh, interest rates, all of those types of things impact the risk on your construction projects. And then there's organizational relationships, your contractual relationships, uh, the attitudes of participants, uh, communication in your organization. These are very, very or important organizational functions that will uh, determine how well your risk are going to be managed. There's also uh, a huge amount of technology uh, issues and opportunities actually in the environment now with design, uh, with BIM utilization, there's, there's site conditions, right? all kinds of data storage and mapping uh, for construction sites. Uh, there's procedures, equipment, the technology now that's available and a lot of our equipment that we use for construction. Uh, all the different types of project management software, design, uh, scheduling, document control, cost control. There's um, all kinds of safety uh, technology that's available. So all of these are challenges, but at the same time, we're in, a environment, in an environment where the opportunities for managing risk are a lot more available. So they, you, you want to make sure as you start thinking about risk on your projects is that you're weighing uh, your risk and then looking at opportunities to manage those risks, right? So there's, there's the type of um, information that requires oversight and control. You know, you've got cash flow, design, you know, the, the drawing specifications, contracts, uh, shop drawings, change management. All these different types of things, project files, production, um, you know, the field activity reports, documenting your project. In many cases, though, when you consider all of these types of risk out there, the highest risk 
in a lot of jobs, a lot of projects, is the human element. Your project managers, your project teams, right? other stakeholders that are involved in your project, their managers, their project teams, and even the consultants that you have involved on your job. There are so many risks, so many opportunities to uh, manage those risks, so many different opportunities to minimize those risks, that it's important that you put a good process in place to uh, identify, manage, and, and resolve those risks. So that's, that's what we're going to be looking at today. Now the traditional mode of managing risk on projects has been to try to shift it. In other words, you know, I, I, don't, I don't want to take the risk of subsurface conditions, for example. So I'll just put in a clause in a contract that says I'm not responsible for anything that you might find whether it's unsuitable soils or, or um, hard material, whatever, right? So you, you, the traditional way was to try to put exculpatory clauses. Those are the clauses that shift risk in a contract. And uh, a lot of times your exculpatory clause, uh, language could be uh, denial of, of adequacy of design, you know, trying to shift your design risk, trying to uh, shift the uh, site risk, trying to shift delay risk, right? All of these things that, that can be shifted, sometimes we try to do that. That's been the traditional mode. What, what organizations have found over the years is that a lot of these shifting attempts don't work and they don't hold up if you get into some kind of disputes. For example, delays. If you try to just put in no damage for delay clauses, a lot of times, you know, it just doesn't hold up because there's so many reasons for delays, whether it's fraud, bad faith, um, active interference, right? Uh, it, lack of access to the project site or delays that you knew were going to probably happen and you tried to shift the risk for that just in case it did. All of those things are uh, exculpatory clauses that can be that can really not only cost you more money because typically uh, contractors will add extra money in their bid, but in a lot of cases they don't hold it up. They don't hold up in a dispute. We call those one-sided contracts. A lot of times they'll generate as many claims as they prevent, right? Construction claims principally are caused by unforeseen change conditions, uh, changes in the work, late provision drawings, all these different elements that can uh, impact a project. But uh, contractors often uh, lose money on a project and they pro it prompts claims no matter what the contract provides. So you really want to avoid trying to uh, just take the mode of shift. However, that's a, um, that is a traditional way and a lot of times owners or developers will end up paying twice. So you say, well, what's the options? What are the options? If I, if I can't just shift the risk, what are the options that I have for managing that risk? Well, the one option that we just talked about is avoiding the risk, right? That's, a, that's what we were just talking about, trying to shift all of the risk, eliminate risk, withdraw from it, or not become involved. Um, you know, that contractors will do that a lot by just subbing out risky items. Owners use contract language to shift the risk. But there are other options. You can share risk, right? You can transfer uh, or outsourcing is one way to do it. Many owners use uh, alternate delivery methods, right? The, C, uh, the contract management at risk type of uh, approach, design build approach where that risk is shared. But at the same time, usually sharing the risk comes with a price. Right? There is another option that you can choose, which is reducing or retaining some of that risk, the, where you optimize or mitigate risk. Ma uh, managing risk using project management techniques. Right? If you have a project and you know the risk, if you can identify those risks, and you think that you have a good system in place to manage those risks, that can be the most cost effective as long as you do manage your risk. So that's so important in a contract. So successful risk management includes, number one, 
you want to identify risk before the project starts. And it's just an exercise that you have to go to. There's no way that every risk can possibly identify, but I'm amazed at how many projects get started without any attempt to identify potential problems. There's that whole avoidance mentality. I don't want to even think about risk, right? Even if you feel you have a handle on potential risk, there's probably many of your stakeholders on your projects, whether it's subcontractors, vendors, suppliers, uh, consultants, many of those stakeholders that you'll be working with and relying on for a successful project may not have a clue of the risk. So the importance is take the time to review a list of risks with your project stakeholders and make sure everyone is on the same page or at least know where uh, those risks may be or know where there may be a disagreement on the risk and the responsibility for those risks. So the first thing, identify the risk. And there's, there are quite a few tools out there. I'm going to give you some real simple ones that will help you just go through and identify the risk. Then you discuss or assess or analyze the risk, right? Assess the risk and potential upsides, potential downsides. Next, once you decide how you can manage those risks, once you have identified them, you analyze them, the possible upside and downside, then you can decide how you'll manage those risks once they occur, if the downside occurs, for example. And then don't forget to agree on a resolution method for each risk. A lot of your risk management programs just deal with those first three, the identify, assess, and manage. But it's so important to have that last one work through and discuss beforehand how you're going to resolve uh, issues that come up that are part of your risk model. If you conduct a risk assessment meeting at the beginning of your project, it's best to do it early while everyone is getting along. In other words, don't wait until you're already running into problems to sit down and have a risk meeting. Right? Make sure you, you take good meeting minutes and distribute it, but do it early. Right? It's best to do it when everyone's getting along in that honeymoon phase of the project. These are the same steps, by the way. If I'm doing a detailed risk analysis for a project, right, I, I go through these same steps. I, I might do it as part of a, for each individual task associated, a lot more detail, but it's still the exact same, st um, the, the same steps. And most project stakeholders don't have resources or budget to prepare a detailed risk analysis task by task on a project. But you'd be surprised how many issues can be addressed and managed at the project level by just following these simple steps. And here is a, uh, here is a, a risk allocation table. And this is, a, this is an old slide that I, I, I put together years ago. I've updated this table. But this is a good, a good very simple way of sitting down with project team stakeholders and just going through different issues and determine beforehand who is responsible. There's three basic categories that these are broken out of. Very simple. There's outside influences. You know, there's governmental acts, weather, acts of God, union strife, you know, cost escalation, uh, collapse of major participants. Those are types of outside influence. And so if you identify those and just have a quick meeting and sit down and talk with the stakeholders of who's responsible for each one. This is a good exercise to go through at the beginning of the project. Then you deal with resources and prerequisites, you know, particular items that are going to be supposed to be supplied, uh, project funding, site ask, access, those types of things. And then you have performance related. Um, you, there's a long list. I'm not going to go through them. But that, that is a, just a good exercise, even no matter how large or how small the project. A simple exercise like this. I've sat in quite a few of these meetings. And it's amazing how things will surface that you can look at as a, as a team and say, wow, we, we are in disagreement on that. Let's get some resolution on how we're going to handle this particular situation, this particular risk element, if uh, it does come up on our job. And once again, this is the same thing I would do on a detailed level, but you can take the same project's uh, process and just run it out on a project in general and you'd be surprised how many things will surface 
that uh, before your project ever starts that you can use for making a uh, you know making a good resolution model for managing risk. Now this, like I said, this is a. There are other items now. This, as I mentioned, this is an older table, but there's there's new things on here as far as documentation with a lot of the technology that you could be adding on adding on to a list like this. Now, knowing where knowing the areas where conflict is likely to arise, and carefully planning to address those areas can reduce the risk of conflict, and it's going to increase the chance of a successful project for everybody. So it's important. Once the risk has been identified, then a good, healthy debate on the obligations is, is essential. So the first key thing is identifying, identifying your risk. And then once you've identified the risk, you can come up with a plan for how you're going to manage it. A lot of times it may be after you've had a risk meeting, you may make a change order to make a, a certain change to address a particular issue. And as you build up a history of risk models, then you can, or risk issues, you can begin to address your general construction contract. That's a good place to start in managing risk, by the way, if you haven't noticed that already. Uh, as you learn from project to project, begin compiling those risk management clauses in your contract. So, I mean, because this is where you can manage risk once they're identified. And then this is where you can define what risk you want to shift, right, whether it's through different uh, project direct, uh, delivery methods or those that you want to retain that you think you can manage because there's cost benefits in managing risk. The party in the project that takes the most risk, you remember, usually will have um, the greatest cost benefits. So learning to manage your risk will help you uh, have the best cost benefit. So the contract is important, but what you want to remember, your contract can't fix or detail every risk. And this is something that uh, I deal with in a lot of these training sessions that I work with, whether it's webinars, seminars, because there are, there are implied obligations that are not spelled out in the contract. So a lot of times where you're trying to shift your risk or you're putting contract clauses in there to manage your risk, you have to remember these types of obligations. These are implied obligations. They're generally uh, broken out into uh, two categories, the contract obligations. There's the express obligations, that's what you spell out in your contract, and then there are these implied obligations. I've given you three here, and these are the three main ones. Uh, one is the implied obligation to inform, right? That's, in other words, you know, issuance of notice proceed is a good example. If you know there's delays out there, but you're going ahead and putting your notice to proceed, you're, you're, you have an implied obligation, you violated that implied obligation to inform in a lot of cases. Or failure to disclose superior knowledge or information that's not readily available to a contractor or subcontractor. It, it's crucial to performance. Uh, the other one is implied obligation to cooperate. I've, I've uh, you know, expediting flow of information. I'm involved in a delay dispute where an owner's consultant took an express obligation. This was a, an obligation that was spelled out in the contract with uh, 21 days to review a submittal. It was set it in the contract, but this occurred on uh, the initial as well as two resubmittals of a particular issue. The two resubmittals required minor changes, and I don't know how an arbitrator is going to decide this issue, but the consultant certainly put the owner at risk by not promptly returning the submittal reviews. In fact, it was, it, it was very suspicious that the submittals took exactly those 21 days. Right? This type of delay is frequent with RFI turnarounds as well, where you think, oh, my contract says I have seven days to respond to an RFI. Right? If you know, and this is why it's important as a contractor, that you identify submittals and RFIs as critical, and as an owner or consultant, if you know that an RFI is critical, then just because you have something in a contract that says you have 7 or 21 days doesn't mean that you, it won't be counted as a delay. So that's the implied duty to cooperate. It includes a, a contractor's duty uh, to notify the owner of delays and impact. And of course, there's always the implied obligation to mitigate. In other words, anytime you have an opportunity 
to recover from a problem, you have an obligation to do that. The contractor has a duty to schedule and coordinate work, right? Execute the work of the various trades on the project in a normal, reasonable sequence, right? The owner has a duty not to delay, hinder, or interfere in the work, right? All of these are implied obligations that may not be spelled out in your contract, but you will be held responsible in most, in most cases. There's all different types of these uh, implied obligations, giving time extensions. Uh, if, if a time extension is warranted. The bottom line, the way to remember whether or not you think you may or may not have a, uh, an issue with your obligations is it comes back to teamwork. In fact, the, the contract is written for the benefit of the project. In other words, what is best for the project? If it's better for you to respond quickly, then that's what you should do because if, if you impact the project in an attempt to impact the other stakeholder, you, it can be a high risk issue. So whatever's best for the project will usually win the day. So just because you have a good contract in place doesn't mean your obligation to inform, cooperate, and mitigate is still not part of your obligation things. This is just a simple example. And I, I use this, those of you, any of you attended my webinars before, you know that I'm a, I'm a believer in the power of a good construction schedule, right? And one of the best risk management tools on the entire project. Um, while tools like BAM are great, they were a great asset during pre-construction and construction, uh, many stakeholders still don't have access to that technology yet. So even though they may in the future, but right now, in today's environment, nearly every stakeholder has, an, uh, has, has a scheduling tool. And if you have a good scheduling tool in your project, it is the best tool, one of the best tools, because it contains every stakeholder's to-do list for the entire project. It's one document that you have on a project that involves everyone's work. So if you can really take some good tips on managing your schedules, this is one of the best ways to manage risk. It will uh, reveal risk as early as possible. Uh, it will, you'll identify potential problems is one of the earliest tools to identify projects because days, time ticks and it doesn't stop. And so when issues come up where you can change money around, you can hide money here and there, but changing it in your spreadsheets, you can't hide time very well. And so a good schedule will usually give you the first indicator of a risky situation. And these two Contract specifications can do more for your risk management than you can imagine. So once you've identified risk, right, then you look at how you can are going to analyze those risks and or assess the risk and, and manage those risks. So here is one of the ways that you can identify and, and work through that whole risk. Number one, put a, a contract specification that where you, all the parties, whoever you want, at least if you're an owner, Make sure that you get involved in the scheduling process before the schedule is ever even submitted. Put it in your contract. It says we're going to have meetings for your project schedule before because as an owner, typically a contractor is doing their schedule, uh, preparing the schedule for the project, and a lot of the items that are going to be critical to the project are owner supplied or are owner or the owner is definitely involved. So put it in your contract to get involved in that process. You'll identify risk early on. You, one of the biggest risks you'll identify early on is whether the contractor really even knows how to plan their work. And that's one of the big risks you'll find early on in a project. So get involved early in that. Find another owner technique. Get it, put it in your spec where you're going to sit down and review that schedule every month. There are some ways that if you manage that schedule appropriately, you can identify problems and you can resolve them so much quicker. I, this is one of the best tools. I say that again, as a scheduling uh, person, that is one of the best tools you can use to manage your project. So, those are two good specs because the key is early identification of issues and risk. Once you identify those, there's not enough time to discuss every type of problem that you that may come up on a project. But I say that every situation I know of, the earlier you resolve it, the better. So when it comes to managing risk. Identifying it early, analyzing it early, 
managing it and getting it resolved early is the, always the best practice. So doing that early. Here, here's a good tool. Some of you may have seen this before. This is a tool that um, it's a project, a critical path monitoring system, or just a process that we have internally. But it's very easy to implement. And it's simple to put together. It can identify risk and problems immediately on a project. Once again, one of your biggest risk identifiers is time. Because if you're looking at a, a project, your time is going to clearly indicate if you're running into problems. So this is a report that we use on all of our projects to report on uh, not only completion dates, but progress during the last period. In other words, uh, are we on schedule? So it's not just enough to be looking at your project and saying, okay, you know, we're going to finish a year from now. What, I, what we do internally and what I recommend is that you look at last week, and last week you said you were going to be here. Mr. Contractor or Mr. Subcontractor, you didn't make it. You missed it by three days, right? This or last month, you said you were going to be here by this time. You missed it by a week or you missed it by two days. The key is here to remember that if you can't tell me what you're going to do this next week and hit it, then the likelihood of you telling me what's going to happen a year from now is very low. So this is one of your best risk management tools, is to have a good time measurement system, just measuring time from week to week. How did you do on what you said last week? A simple report like this brings along accountability. Uh, it, not only it helps uh, with accountability, it'll help you identify issues. And this is one of those early resolution things um, so that you can avoid the claims. Because those are to those, that's probably in our surveys and the clients that we work with, that's one of the highest risks that they look at is, is the claims process. So getting these types of system in, systems in place will really help you avoid. The question is, you know, are, what does it mean to be on schedule? In other words, just because you're going to finish, say you're finish a year from now, are you hitting what you're saying you're going to do next week? Right? That's what's important. And once you do that, by managing those issues early, managing those risks early, you can minimize the risk of a delay if you identify and manage it early. And this is one of those, this is uh, a slide I use quite a bit, it's very simple, but it's, it's one of the best ways to, uh, best examples that I know of, of minimizing risk on a project. For example, an owner has a 10-day delay, right? Contractor says you delayed me 10 days. I want 10 days of time extension at you know $5,000 a day. That's $50,000 for those 10 days. Well, as an owner, you have an option. You can say, well, I'm going to wait till the end of the job to see if he finishes on time, or I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to avoid this situation, and I think I won't have to give them days. Or maybe, as an owner, you're saying I don't owe them any days. I don't owe them any days. I disagree with it, right? Well, when it comes, and obviously you're in dispute. So let's say your risk, the contractor thinks he's right, you think you're right. Your risk, let's say you're 50-50, right? So you could possibly be right, but the contractor may be right. So in other words, there is risk involved. You could look at that and say, well, since there is risk involved, how can I minimize that risk? And in almost, in most delays, probably 75%, I've read reports that say different things. My experience uh, has been that the majority of delays happen early in a project. Well, what that means is if you identify it, assess it, manage through it to minimize the delay, now you can resolve it and minimize your risk. As an example, as an owner, instead of waiting to the end of the job to see if that contractor finishes on time, or just saying no, look at it and say, hey, we disagree with you. We disagree. We think that 10 days of delay was yours. However, let's look at the critical path of your project. You can look down in here and say the critical path of your project, I look down through that critical path and I say, you know what, here are a couple of activities down here where I will pay you to work overtime. 
I, I this happened one uh, on one project I was working with with the DOT, where they had a couple of the contractor had a couple of hauling activities uh, that were later on in their critical path, way down towards the end of the job. And they had you know 20 days in those hauling activities, a big major haul, and the owner said, "Hey, I will pay you extra to work double shifts." and reduce that haul duration, let's say, by 10 days. So by taking uh, that approach, the owner was able to mitigate those 10 days. I think the, the only extra cost that he had was maybe two or $3,000 for some light plants or something like that. I can't remember exactly what the costs are, but it was minimal. So the owner was able to mitigate days, even though they didn't agree with the contractor on their, on their uh, potential delays, but instead of just saying no and taking the risk that the contractor, some arbitrator might side with the contractor, they managed and resolved that risk just by looking at a critical path item and saying, hey, reduce the duration down here. I'll pay for this. And for $2,000, they, they were able to completely eliminate that risk. Those are examples of managing the risk, managing those risks early. And uh, that's one of the reasons why the schedule is so important. I'm using that as examples. You can do the same thing uh, with costs and change order type uh, uh, systems, where you can identify issues that come up early. If you're having a lot of potential change orders, orders early, you can start implementing processes and procedures that will help you uh, resolve and, and uh, identify those problems and deal with them early. So you can. Uh, these are just good ways of managing risk early using the schedule. Here is um, the documentation, as I mentioned earlier. Maintaining a good contract uh, project record. The next, this is one of the next best tools for managing risk during the construction, is having a transparent communication and collaboration tool. That means having a system where all of your documentation I showed it in the slide, all of your documentation, everything from down in the proprietary documents, uh, and I, I, I break these out just from my claims experience over the past when I received documents on a claim. One of the first challenges is going through all these boxes of documents and organizing them. So I got in the habit years ago of immediately breaking all my project records out into contract documents. Here's all the project documents. That's anything that's been officially transmitted, you know, submittals, transmittals, RFIs, those kind of things. And then the, the other kind is proprietary documents. Having a good organization system for managing your project record and documentation. Because ultimately, even those proprietary documents are going to tie into where your money flows, which is up in your contract document section, right? That's how the documentation flows in a project. Right? So the key is having a good transparent communication and collaboration tool. It's a good tool for communication organization. It's well organized so you not only help avoid conflicts, but as you probably all know, it can help you resolve conflicts as well, right? They always say whoever has the most documentation type stuff wins. But it's not just enough to document in managing risk. This is important. You can have a good documentation system but transparency, particularly in today's economy, will help you see risk that you would normal that would normally not be seen. Uh, for example, we use a, a free online tool to do all this stuff. It's not only documents what, that don't, not only documents when something sent, but it documents when something was received and when something was seen. You know, if I post a document to be downloaded, for example, an RFP or uh, drawings, etc. It tracks who downloaded the document and when, right? And because it's free, every stakeholder gets to use it. So having, and so that just adds more transparency. Transparency is a, a big thing in the document control side of, of your project. Being able to have the ability to see not only what I'm documenting, but what everyone else is doing as well in the project. And it's not a matter of sneaking, it's just a matter of, of transparency. So documentation and transparency is another good tool for managing projects. And then one uh, another issue in risk management, you can't cover all of them obviously, but one big issue in risk management 
is managing disputes because you, you get into dispute situations where you have claims that are being uh, filed. Analyzing the risk of claims is so important. Dispute, you know, we, we mentioned just a few minutes ago how important it is to identify those potential claims, resolving them to eliminate risk. Once they occur, and I haven't been in a situation yet where someone has been able to completely avoid all claims, there are, you know, some work better than others, but as we discussed, you know, identifying risk is important, assessing and analyzing risk, managing those risks, and finally, resolution of risk. You know, when you get to the point where a downside risk has occurred and no resolution has been reached, it's important to continue risk management in the resolution process. So it's, you manage risk at the beginning by identifying the risk of a project, assessing those risks, working with your team to avoid them, to manage through them, resolve them, but all the way through the project, here at the end, now you have claims. Here's risk analysis techniques. You take those same four steps to go through when you want, when you have a claim and you need to analyze it, right? The first is performing a risk analysis for the claim. The first step in managing risk and dispute resolution is identifying and analyzing the claim's risk. The question is, you know, how much is a claim worth, for example? Well, identifying the elements of the dispute, analyzing them is just essential at this point. I treat a claim, and I encourage my clients, treat a claim just like it's a project. So the first thing you do, you go through each part of the claim, and you identify the risk. How much is the claim worth? Identify the elements of the dispute and analyze them just uh, appropriately. It's extra work, right? Extra work that is well documented. Uh, maybe entitlement is in dispute. Maybe they're, they're not worth the. Uh, it could be that the claim is not valid because the contractor is not entitled to anything. Uh, that may be a high risk, right? It may be a contract conflict or other upside and downside. You need to review it to see, because a lot of times extra work, if it's well documented, can, uh, can be a high risk uh, situation. So analyzing your risk, going into that, looking at that, to analyze what's our upside, what's our downside. Delays can be disputed for entitlement and, and or, or quantity. Loss of productivity, efficiency losses are the easiest to substantiate from an entitlement standpoint because they're usually a result of so many changes that uh, they, they cause the loss of productivity. That's typically a loss of productivity is there's so many changes. So entitlement may be easy. However, substantiation of time and cost for productivity claim can be very difficult to support. Right? So there's, there's the four, for example, loss of productivity, there's the four criteria that have to be addressed for it to be successful. You know, you would have been productive uh, had it not been for the delays. Um, you, there's no other way to identify this other than, you know, a total cost in most cases. Uh, it's all the other party's response. You have to go through these process in managing, looking at your risk on the claim. Uh, the delays are uh, another issue. You know, how has this delay uh, impacted uh, the project? For example, you could have uh, an early completion delay claim. You know, an early completion delay claim, you have two different, you have two separate portions of it, possibly, that are going to, that you're going to look at to analyze the risk or manage the risk in that situation. If you have a contract time here and you have a portion of the delay that's after it, that is a lower risk for a contractor, right? Because they, uh, they're not having to get through the hurdles of early completion. So if you're a contractor and you're putting together a claim that includes portion, uh, an argument that you would have completed early, that's a lower risk. So you take a look at those days and you apply a risk factor to those. And if you're asking for a certain amount of early completion days, or if a contractor is asking for an early completion, um, certain early completion days, there's a whole new level of hurdles that you have to deal with. First, the uh, the contractor has to show that they would have completed early, they planned on completing early, um, did they have the capacity to do so, 
or the capability to do so. And then obviously you have to show that the contractor, or if you're a contractor, you have to be able to demonstrate that you would have had, you would have been able to complete early, but for the delays. So just taking a delay claim as a, a delay portion of a claim and analyzing that will help you look at the potential upside or the potential downside. And it's important for both sides to do this. Um, another big factor in resolving the uh, claims is the uh, the preparation costs. Just recently I, I looked at a claim for a client and we were looking at resolving a conflict as quick as possible. Even though my client felt he had a good position for defending against this claim, the issue was so complicated for the size of the claim, there was enough mud on everyone and the cost of executing it and preparing reports and doing an as-built schedule and looking at all the cost and analyzing the contractor's claim, it was going to be so expensive. We went through this process of analyzing the risk and we just decided it would just be better to settle. The contractor was asking for amount and it was the same with the contractor. So we went down went and argued with the contractor or, or we discussed with the contractor, hey, both of us, it's going to be too expensive. Here's the risk on both sides. Let's settle and just get out of the whole claim without going through the process of, of fighting. Another big issue is, is staff allocation. In fact, that's one of the many factors that uh, stakeholders forget to consider is your managerial factors in dispute resolution, right? Your, your reputation in the industry, the cost of future contracts and disputes, not to mention just the loss of focus. In, or in, in an organization as they work on claims and, and just work through that process. So analyzing the claims, managing through those, once you've managed, once you've identified the claims or once you've identified your risk in the claims, you've analyzed them, you've gone through these different factors in a claim to come up with a good, you know, really a good um, example of what my risks are on the claim, then you treat it like a project and manage it. Right? Just manage through it. Identifying the risk, assessing them, managing it, and then resolving it. Once again, those four steps are going to help you at every stage of your project. I want, I want to close with one of my favorite, most insightful risk management guidelines I've seen. A while back, in fact a few years back, I heard uh, Gordon Graham give a presentation and uh, he brought in the Rickover rules of risk management. So I did some I did some research, and he, Rick Ober was uh, one of the great icons of the 20th century. He was, was, was an admiral, actually, Admiral Hyman Rickover. He's known as the father of the American nuclear program. Uh, he was born in Poland, but he, he rose to the rank of admirable, uh, admiral and directed the development of our nuclear navy here in the U.S., which has a tremendous safety record. He recognized he was dealing with high risk, highly risky, highly complex issues, and he developed rules for success. And I've listed these so you can read them, and they're very important. I've, I've made just a, a few adjustments, uh, very few, just to relate them more to you know construction projects. And here's rule number one. You must have a rising standard of quality over time and well beyond what's required by a minimum standard. Here's what I mean by that. Here is one of the elements that he brought out. Ongoing training. Continue training over time. Get your people on in your projects, on your staff, training. So, how, you know, how often do you put your people through training? You know, if, if I go get my hair cut for $20, and that person that's cutting my hair has to get recertified every year, how about your staff? Is it worth it to get your staff trained? Uh, we have to get better and better at what we do all the time. Our staff does it. Our organizations and the people that they serve deserve it, right? Our personnel deserve it. We've always done it this way. It just doesn't work anymore, right? Any on any organizational level, there are better ways to get and keep good people. And having a good policy manual, all these types of training, Offered at the uh, organizational level, getting and keeping good people uh, at the operational level, you got to improve performance and per, uh, response times. All of these types of things, continuous improvement 
has got to be a part of the way we do business. That's what Admiral, Admiral Rickover said. And then rule number two, people running complex projects should be highly capable. In other words, hire quality people, make good hires. And he said this was so important. I'm amazed at organizations that I work with, worked with in the past, they'll put a $100 million project with a $30,000 a day burn rate and, and even more in, in different risk if you had liquidated damages or whatever. They'll put a project like that in the hands of a fresh engineer, right, with a couple of days of scheduling training, for example, and expect them to manage the critical path on that job effectively, right? There's $100 million at risk. You know, I, I'm amazed at how people, you know, organizations do that, right? Successful projects require people with experience who know how to think. 50 years ago, you could get by with a lot of that kind of stuff, but those, those things have changed. Technology, equipment, strategies, and tactics um, have, have changed. And so if you hire people who can't think things through, you're en route to disaster. If you allow the hiring, this is what uh, Rick Over said, if you allow the hiring of idiots, they will not disappoint you. <laughs> They'll always be idiots. In view of the consequences that can occur when things don't go right in your project, this may, be, uh, may end up being the cause of a future tragedy. So every nickel you spend in weeding out losers up front has the potential to save you millions of dollars. And uh, here's, a, here's rule number three. Supervisors have to face bad news when it comes to, uh, when it comes and take problems to a high level enough to fix those problems right away. In other words, get good supervisors, uh, not necessarily a popularity contest, uh, but a lack of good supervision can lead to serious problems. Um, when you take a, a, an honest look at disaster, disastrous projects in any aspect of construction, from lawsuits to uh, uh, just problems on the, at the site. So many of them get down to supervisors not behaving like supervisors. Uh, the primary mission of a supervisor is implementing systems, putting good programs together that people can follow. So promoting the right people to help the people do the right thing is the bottom line. Get good supervisors. Rule number four, you must have a healthy respect for the dangers and risk of your particular project. In other words, respect the risk, right? Know that the risk is right in front of you. Now, many projects are high risk in nature, and the consequences for not doing things right can be dramatic. Remember the basic rules of risk management. Identify, assess, manage, and resolve. You must do a risk assessment on each project and identify the tasks that have the highest probability of causing you grief. Then you can prioritize those things and it'll help you address and rec the recognized risk appropriately and prevent those negative consequences, right? The next rule, number five, training must be constant and rigorous. Every day is a training day. Repetition is critical. Every day, uh, as you're training, you have to focus the training on the task in every job description that have the highest probability of causing you grief. There are certain positions on your job that are high-risk positions. Get the right people in there and train them to do the job right. These are high-risk, low-frequency, low-discretionary time events, right? You must assure that all personnel are adequately trained to address the task. Okay, rule number six. All functions of repair, quality control, and technical support must fit together. In other words, Documentation is part of that. Audits are a big part of that. Putting audits in place, constant reviews, constant surveys. Audits and inspections are an important part of your job as a leader in your organization on your project. You cannot assume that all is going well. Most claims end up, or most pro disastrous projects, it's amazing how many executives that didn't see it coming, right? So you must have control measures in place to assure things are being done right. And this is not micromanagement. It's just called doing your job. In fact, uh, Dan mentioned earlier, on your survey today, there's a question on your survey that you can respond to uh, regarding schedule, audit, uh, schedule audits, uh, audits. Many of you rely on third-party data for your projects. 
you either have contractors submitting schedules to you each month or as a contractor you have project schedulers out in the different projects maintaining individual project schedules, right? Well, we've developed an excellent audit and import process for public organizations trying to implement enterprise schedule reporting systems for projects. But you're concerned about third-party data, right? Well, audits are a very good tool uh, for you to help bring all of that together. It's, it's very simple to do. It just takes, you know, uh, just a very simple process. But it's also good for contractors who want to bring all of that data in uh, to a, an enterprise system so you get good reports. If you don't have audits, formal or informal, in place, uh, you'll not know about problems until they become consequences. And then you're in the domain of lawyers and consultants, and it's too late for action at that point. All you can do then is address consequences, right? If you take the time to study uh, the life of Admiral, Admiral Rickover, you'll quickly learn that he was widely despised in the Navy because of his insistence on using the audit process as a tool to hold people accountable. So audits are very, very important. Rule number seven, the organization and members thereof must have the ability and willingness to learn from mistakes of the past. Once again, continuous learning, putting audit results into practice. Analysis of past data is the foundation for almost all risk management. In other words, keeping a good record so that you can analyze it to see, hey, in the past, this issue keeps surfacing. Our memory can only go so far. That's why we have reporting tools. So you can identify, and you'll be surprised how many things pop up that say, that comes up on nearly every project. I need, we need to address that issue. As I read lawsuits and project claims, uh, see organizational embarrassments, uh, I know that we can learn so much by studying mistakes we've made in the past. It all gets down uh, just to risk management. When you've identified risk, there's three simple rules, right? There's, here's three simple rules that uh, you shouldn't forget. There's no new ways to get in trouble. The issues that surface on your projects today will be the same stuff that's happened over and over again. Very seldom do I see anything new happen on a construction project. Number two, strive for continuous improvement. All of this that we're talking about really boils down to this. It's nothing new. Look for continuous improvement. That means on every project, risks are going to be managed on this project than it was on the last. Always look for improvement. And the bottom line is predictable is preventable. If I know, and if I know that none of these issues that are going to come up are probably going to be new, it's going to be stuff that has come up before, if I can look at what's come up before and I can improve on it, I know that I can prevent and manage most of these risks. In other words, learn from your mistakes. If you become a good risk management organization, you're going to get all of the cost benefits of managing risk. If you remember early on, that's what we talked about. Whoever takes the most risk usually gets the best cost benefit. So learning to manage the risk in your organization instead of trying to just shift it or share it, learn to manage it. And the more risk you can manage, the better off you'll be as an organization. Uh, let me see if we have any questions. That's going to do it for our session today. Let's see... Um, I had one uh, question for including opportunities for cost reduction or schedule acceleration as part of the risk management tool. I think maybe we dealt with that a little bit. Obviously, uh, schedule acceleration is part of a risk management plan. I, just a, one example that we used earlier is being able to reduce tasks on a good, if you have a good critical path of a project, you can look at what activities you can accelerate that have the least amount of risk. For example, and in fact the example that I used, any tasks that are equipment driven as opposed to high labor tasks typically are less risky. High labor, more risk. High equipment, lower labor, less risk. 
So if you're looking to accelerate the schedule, instead of just saying, I'm, I'm involved in schedules a lot of times in projects where it's, we're going 24-7. Everybody's working overtime to get it done, right? That's a high-risk approach to acceleration. Managing that critical path is, a, is an important part. Um, I've got a couple questions on the chart that I had. If you fill out the survey, I will send you the handouts that has the charts. In fact, if you have any particular questions on any of those, uh, please feel free to um, just drop me a note. Here's my contact information. Um, just drop me a note, and if you have any questions on any of these items that we discuss, do that. Um, and uh, just feel free to drop us a, uh, a question. I think that's about all the time we have for today. If anybody uh, feel, wants to contact me, feel free to do so. And I do want to thank you again for attending the webinar. Make sure you complete the survey, and uh, we will uh, be in touch. Thank you so much.